Welcome to the 22nd edition of the Panama interview series, where we discuss topics regarding foreign direct investment in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, we're streaming live from the capital city of the Republic of Panama this afternoon. Uh, the Panama interview series is produced by Vico Legal and Compliance Consulting LLC, a Miami domiciled limited liability corporation with offices in downtown Miami and Panama City, Panama. We provide international, commercial, and transactional legal and regulatory compliance advice and related services to manufacturers and brand owners that seek to boost profit and hedge domestic, domestic risk through international distribution in the U.S. and in Latin America and the Caribbean. My name is Anthony Robinson, and I'm the managing member of Beco Legal and Compliance Consulting. In the past several editions of the Panama interview series, we've discussed the future of probiotics in Latin America and the Caribbean, and the potential of probiotics to contribute to the post-COVID economic recovery of the region. But in the May edition, and today uh, we discuss microbiome research and development because probiotics are just part of a larger picture concerning the bacteria in and on our bodies, the human microbiome, and the microbiota of animals. Likewise, the gut and skin microbiota of humans and animals is just one component of what scientists term the global microbiome, which has its evolutionary origin in the ancient microbial world that existed long before the emergence of multicellular life forms and the development of digestive tracts. The global microbiome consists of all of the incredibly numerous microorganisms that are capable of dissemination in most places via the atmosphere, water, wind, biological vectors, excreta fluids, and that consequently occur in almost all environments found on the surface of the planet Earth. Why should we care about the global microbiome? Number one, there's a finite pipeline of new bioactive chemical entities and entities derived from natural products for drug discovery due to the reliance on the 1% of organisms generally regarded as culturable. And the answer, secondly, may be in unlocking the chemistry of the remaining 99% of unculturable microorganisms in the global microbiome to obtain drug-like natural compounds. To help us understand the promise of small molecules accessed directly from natural microbiome habitats to serve as an alternative path in the quest to reinvigorate the biopharma pipeline. We are honored to have as our guest, Ross Young, CEO and founder of Biosortia Microbiomics. Biosortia is a company dedicated to microbiome mining for pharmaceutical discovery. Ross, Ross's big, hairy, audacious goal is to uncover the small molecules in aquatic microbiomes that signal biological activities to potentially lead to new treatments, therapies, and advances in medicine, agriculture, and other fields to improve the health and well being of humanity and the planet. Biosortia has developed an environmentally friendly microbiome prospecting platform designed to collect microbiomes from large water volumes in their natural or original position of place while preserving their physical and chemical integrity. Biosortia is just the latest endeavor in Ross's over 30 year career of inventing better, faster, and less expensive products, technologies, and processes for in a variety of industries. Uh, we have several topics to cover in 60 minutes. Accordingly, please put your questions in the chat, and I will submit them to Ross afterwards. Let's just jump, jump in. Ross, welcome. How are you this afternoon? I am doing fantastic, and Tony, it's, this is a real pleasure, so thank you for inviting me to participate. No, no, it's our pleasure, and, um, you know, um, I first came to know of you uh, through the audiobook Microbiome Mavericks, uh, that's authored by um, a microbiome expert named Dr. Amin Sorghani. I want to give give him his credit. Um, I highly recommend the audiobook, especially Chapter 12, which is on, uh, which is about Ross. 
Uh, the book is a fascinating combination of both the technical aspects of the contribution that each of the microbiome mavericks is making to the microbiome, to microbiome research and development, and also the professional journey that each maverick uh, is taking or has taken as a scientist and entrepreneur. Ross, you have a diverse background. You've done almost everything uh, in your fields, um, spanning from engineering process to advancing early new stage technologies in, in bioplastic and biofuels. Tell us about your path to creating BioSortia. No, I appreciate that. I, I, I think you're right. It's a generalist background. And I think in a specialist industry like life science, because people create careers with a very defined focus. I've been lucky that I've been exposed to so many different technologies across so many different fields of endeavor. And I think that's giving me a toolkit that allows me to look at things a little differently. So in getting to Biosortia, I studied environmental science, industrial engineering, worked in the uh, medical imaging business, the video and optical disc business, the plastics industry, um, and then bioplastics, biofuels. And I think I learned enough through all of those things to continue to be very, very curious. Um, and it was Harvard Business Review that published a study, where does breakthrough innovation come from? And 50% does come from specialists in a field, and that makes perfect sense. But what's hard to believe is 50% comes from generalists. And when I think about my pathway, our team's pathway to Biosortia, it was we stumbled upon some things that looked very promising in an area that was not well served. And that was, how do you get microbes out of a very dilute solution? And getting microbes out of a dilute solution, the technologies that existed mostly have been around water and wastewater, and it's about cleaning the water. In our particular case, we wanted the microbes intact and we wanted the microbes preserved rapidly once they were pulled from their habitat. That made this an opportunity to understand what we could do with those microbes. And I know you're going to ask me 100 questions about that, so I'll just stop there. It was that technology innovation that was based on biomimicry and the physics of adhesion and co-adhesion to water and materials that was the spark that ultimately led to this new revolutionary technology. So we have this timeline here that, that, that everyone can see that's the timeline of the, the life of your company, if I'm not mistaken. So you were, is this tracking from 2008 when you were formed to uh, going forward? And you? It is. So in 2008, one of the first things we were challenged with, because we started to look at, at plastics being uh, made by uh, biomass. And we were working with uh, Battelle, which is a major research organization, and the Ohio Soybean Council. And pretty quickly, internally, we started to look at the excess biomass from eutrophic waters as a potential to solve two problems. Could we make plastic out of polluted water? And that was essentially what we were looking at initially. And the first problem was how do you get this very dilute biomass out of the water? It may look thick, but there is very little of it in the water. It may be in a part per 10,000. So the biomass had to come out efficiently. And that was the path that we started on working with the Department of Energy in their very first Advanced Research Projects Agency's award, which allowed us to take our technology and move it through its first scaling. And we were able to do that with them, and I would say quite successfully. And then about 2012, we run into the awful luck as every participant in the original ARPA-E proposals and that is when Solyndra in California lost the DOE about a half a billion dollars. 
the funding for any other research projects uh, to follow on in ARPA were cut by Congress for a period of time. And that meant there was no path forward for this technology. And it was at that point we recognized through some of the people that worked with us and then some of the people we were to leverage that we had found tens of thousands of small molecules within our biomass that could potentially revolutionize discovery. And that's, that's the exciting part. And uh, now we've advanced the technology. We are ready to execute at full scale. We have executed at subscale, and we have shown that we can find these kind of molecules that are therapeutically relevant. And I think one of the challenges in this pathway is there was a dynamic amongst the industry that we have all the molecules we need. We have molecules that are synthetic chemistry, synthetic biology, trillions of those molecules. And we also heard that there was lots of natural products. But what there wasn't was the small molecules from microbes, the ones that are really there to interact at the cellular level. And those are what our technology really brings forward into research. And we believe it's not only going to impact all of therapeutics, but it'll impact agrochemical and sustainability and many other life science industries. So one of the acute problems that you were facing was there was a, a, a finite pipeline for in traditional pharmaceutical uh, development. Is that right? And, and could you talk about why there, what, there, there is or was a finite pipeline and how you're solving that? Yeah, so I, I used this slide at a presentation at George Mason University earlier this year. And I wanted to talk a little bit about where drugs came from. And quite frankly, plants and animals, which a lot of those molecules were produced by microbes inside of those organisms. And at the time, we didn't know it. But now we do. And then when you look at culturing microbes, more than half of all drugs on the shelf have a tie to microbes that have been able to be grown in a lab. And as you mentioned, less than 1% of the microbes can grow in a lab. So if you look at biological sources, it's essentially about 75% of all drugs on the shelf, directly, indirectly, or inspirationally. Synthetic chemistry certainly has provided some, and it's a key technology for manipulating molecules from nature. And synthetic biology has made trillions of molecules using synthetic biology, but this hasn't panned out and worked to the success level originally imagined because nature is incredibly complex in how it makes a molecule. And in synthetic biology, it's very simplistic in nature. So it's making compounds that don't really work in nature, even though they emerged from nature. We're here to say that this industrial scale microbiome mining is the future because it limits the access to microbes. Uh, it, 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 it basically gets rid of the limiting aspect to microbes, meaning we can now get microbes where they reside within the natural world. And that's one thing that we've been able to prove. We hope to ultimately open that up to 100% of the microbes. And a lot of that occurs because nature is somewhat redundant, meaning it uses the same molecules over and over within its metabolic pathways and its genomics, allowing us to interrogate areas and find the molecules where they reside and hopefully open up new opportunities to cure treat disease, and impact all of life sciences. Well, that's a good segue to this side. So the market opportunity uh, that Biosorcia is addressing um, is what this slide is about. Could you speak to this a little bit? Yeah, and our Biosorcia model is to do what nobody in the world is doing. So there are so many experts we can work with that are trying to find cures or treatments or, or uh, improve the health of crops. 
or sustainability, whether it's mitigating red tide or it happens to be cosmetics for all that matters. There's so many people that are looking for new products and they certainly have looked at the existing libraries and pipelines that exist. We can bring a mass of new materials into researchers' hands and with technologies today, high throughput screening, uh, un understanding what these molecules are and how to be able to make a uh, GMP or good manufacturing practice for these molecules, we can combine the best of technologies today to bring the best materials into science. And our approach is to be that collaborator, to be that partner. We wanna be the best at industrial scale microbiome mining, getting these molecules out, using machine learning and AI to prioritize and curate for purposes, and also be able to build the connections between genomics, between the actual molecules that those pathways create and those gene clusters create, and then importantly, the activity that has shown up in actual testing and screening. So we think life sciences can rapidly advance by having access to this hidden signaling of really microbes. And that's, that's where we're focused. We know there's people out there that can take a molecule and move it to the next stage. We wanna bring them the molecule that hits those targets and does that. Okay, when, when Biosource uh, reaches its uh, you know, maturity point and um, we're uh, realizing that vision, um, what is it gonna look like? So when people are looking, I wanna invest in this, this is a good opportunity, what's it gonna look like mature? Yeah, I think what it's gonna happen is um, it's going to, whenever you have a startup technology, and I've been lucky to see this in medical imaging, video and optical disc, biofuels, whenever you have a startup technology that's at day one, the opportunity to accelerate that, to improve it, to enhance it is almost natural. So you make great leaps in a technology early. And I think that's what's going to happen here. The beauty of this technology is if you take existing ability to find a small molecule in an unculturable microbe and use that as a baseline, we're not 10 times of an improvement, we're seven orders of magnitude or a million times deeper into those molecules than any existing technology. And it is all about scale. So what you see here is potentially a future harvesting unit. This was essentially something that we're imagining could be in Chesapeake Bay or could be in the Indian River, St. John's River area where there's such a diversity of microbiomes, meaning so many different opportunities to find new molecules. And that scale is dramatically beyond where we're at today. So I just said we're seven orders of magnitude improvement. We see an easy pathway to eight orders of magnitude improvement and even into nine orders of magnitude improvement. Now, why is that important? I often use this example of showing a flask with 100 milliliters in it. 100 milliliters is a typical benchtop lab sample. In fact, this may be big if someone's doing genomics. This, we would start with a minimum of 200 million times this. Now, if there's a molecule in a part per billion in here without some way of concentrating, it's unreadable with a mass spec. But once you start with so much and you do that concentration, you get to an entire next level of capability of accessing this hidden chemistry of life. So much so that milligrams of a sample of a um, small molecule within a microbe that's in a microbiome is accessible and even gram quantities, which is the range for really starting a project in the early preclinical stages. So you really beat uh, existing ways to do things. If you look at the natural libraries that exist, 
you may not have enough of that to really even identify a molecule. Well, our whole approach is all about accelerating the ability to find and move these molecules forward. And also because they are already pre-optimized by nature, by biology, these things have a smoother pathway through the clinic, through preclinical, both faster and potentially more efficient. So we think we can change the entire di dynamic of discovery. Let me let me just for for my to to orientate myself. So one step back. So you know traditionally, um, you know. Uh, Pharmaceutical drug development has focused on the the one percent of uh, culturable organisms. Is that correct? So, uh, an organism that can grow in a uh, lab environment and is living. Is that a, a? It is. So it can scale up, so that when you do the deconvolution work, you can get at those small molecules. And sometimes you even have to scale it up much more. Because if you run that process and don't have enough of a molecule of interest, then you've got to go back and grow a lot more of something. And sometimes the same metabolic pathway may not actually uh, be performing such that it, it will be available. And that's one of the challenges with culturing is you can grow microbes, but will it elicit a metabolic pathway of interest? So you really don't have access to the wealth of the capability of that microbe. So is, is, the, is the premise of, of uh, biosources strategy to tap into the potential of the unculturable organisms that other 99% that traditionally we haven't had access to? Exactly, and what won't elicit in culture. So we get a, a win in even though 1% has been culturable, there is many metabolic pathways that in culture will not elicit. So you'll never see those chemistries. And with microbiome mining, you can go to various habitats and that's what's beautiful about the aquatic environment or a liquefied habitat in some way is you have such a diversity of habitats that will allow these species to have different, let's say, uh, communities of organisms around there and therefore elicit different metabolic pathways. So you could go to a microbiome that's in your backyard today and recover it and uh, 200 days later, 150 days later, it'll be completely different just because of succession of, of species and the changes in the uh, environment and things like that. So it's almost an endless supply, but let me not leave anybody confused. The small molecules in nature are truly the least common denominator, meaning that because there's such redundancy on small molecules, it may be the smallest, most accessible number when you talk about cellular signaling. To put that in perspective, lots of different genes and metabolic pathways may make one small molecule. Therefore, the complexity of the code is much more complex than the small molecule that results in the code. And that becomes really critical because you want to, in science, make sure you've got the least amount of variables as possible. And that's what access to the small molecules do. Now, when you look at the possibilities of small molecules that have been calculated under 500 molecular weight, you're talking about one times 10 to the 62nd power, which is a number so massive, you could calculate and try to figure that out forever. The reality of it is nature didn't make that many molecules. It may have had that many tries. It may have had way more than that many tries, but it only retained molecules that work. And that number might not even exceed one times 10 to the eighth power, which still sounds like a large number, but it's nothing remotely 
near the possibilities of synthetic biology, synthetic chemistry, or genomics itself. So it really is the least common denominator. Okay, so the building blocks of what Biosorcia is doing is is where is Biosorcia is building um, the world's largest library of microbiome derived compounds, right, for therapeutic and other applications by leveraging the company's microbial harvesting platform to sample and mine aquatic microbiomes. So if we could just take each piece of that. So um, the microbiome derived compounds that are in your library, um, can you give me an example of one of them? First, why are we, we've already talked about the potential of small molecules, so we know the why. So the, the question is, you know, what are they? Let me put my hand on it. Let me touch and see one and feel it. What are the, what are, give me an example of one of the molecules in your, in your library. So it goes across the board because of what has been proven over the last 10 years about the human gut microbiome. And the first thing I'll say that's critically important for people to understand is the microbes, many of them that are sourced within our own human body, are also environmentally out there. So there's an overlap of genes and metabolic pathways to the aquatic habitats that overlap the human gut microbiome by 73%, meaning mm -hmm. much of the molecules, much of the small molecules that we don't know that exist in the human actually exist in the aquatic habitats. So that's the first thing that's really important about connecting the dots. The second thing that's really important about connecting the dots is having access to these molecules, you're going to find opportunities to treat or let's say cure human diseases, whether it's infections. So think about infectious disease, think about neuro CNS and the opportunity to bring next generation molecules uh, from microbes that can hit those targets, metabolic, uh, when you talk about immuno-oncology or oncology or even immunomodulation throughout the human, all of these opportunities exist in the microbes and the kind of small molecules that those microbes make. And there are plenty of examples of finding nature's small molecules to hit all those targets that I just talked about. Having access to the microbes will change the dynamic dramatically. This may be one, this is one example, correct? The, uh... That's a great example. Um, this was subscale because it was 370,000 liters to find what were therapeutically relevant, unknown small molecules within the aquatic environment. Uh, these are uh, akin to something like uh, Digitox, or bufalin. Bufalin is a natural product used in China uh, for treating uh, certain heart ailments. Um, it's a toxin that's, you know, most of us would be familiar with amphibians or toads. It's also produced by plants. But this was the first example that this molecule existed within a microbiome. And it existed in a new, number of different forms that were never seen by science. And some of them were even more potent and more toxic. Uh, even though those molecules have been heavily researched in all that research, they've never found these versions. And when we went to nature, we found new inspiration or new molecules. And this is one example of finding a molecule by going very deep into the microbiome at a unheard of scale. There's probably not a researcher on this uh, podcast right now that has ever even thought about going beyond a thousand liters of sample. Right. So um, why, why the aquatic uh, microbiome as uh, compared to uh, you know, soil or rock environments? Why, the, why aquatic? Well, uh, when you have water, you have diversity of life. That's not to say that the soil is not a rich source, but the sediment 
of the aquatic environment is every bit as rich as the soil. Some of the exact same species that reside in the soil will reside in the sediment. Sediment's gonna be also uh, liquefiable, um, uh, meaning that you can use extraction technologies to separate out the microbes and do it rapidly. So this is a technology at day one. The aquatic environment is perfect because there is already such immense diversity there whether it has oxygen or whether there's no oxygen, whatever the temperature is, whatever the nutrients that actually flow in there naturally, whatever the pH is, whatever the sunlight is, there's such diversity of the microbiomes in the aquatic environment. It's the low hanging fruit. It's the easiest to access to end up with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of small molecules that can be obtained researched in the two dimension computationally machine learning ai then connected to activities through screening and then the actual deconvolution of the structure of the molecule to connect all the dots so it really opens up and you've just pulled up the slide that talks about that it opens up and breaks down the firewall that exists between the code and what is actually existing. So lots of people have been able to look at the genomic code, but they can't get directly from the genomic code without some level of inspiration or some level of clarity and understanding to those small molecules. So that firewall between the code and those molecules and the activity is real and as science does industrial scale microbiome mining and benefits from it, that firewall will be eliminated. Well, I, you know, I think we've, we've talked about uh, the, the why and the where. Um, the how is what we need to understand. Uh, you know, we, I, I would like for us to talk about the, the harvesting, the mining and the harvesting platform and how that functions and works and operates. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about how about that process. Yeah, it's it's pretty straightforward. It's completely environmentally friendly. So we've even processed in a marine sanctuary under state, local and federal approval. So it's a non-chemical process. And we start the process by scouting, understanding is there genomic diversity within this habitat? Is there indication that there's chemicals at the major level that have not been tested or that are unknown. And typically it's a untapped habitat across the board. So we can scout sites to determine that that's where we wanna go. Then we will harvest. Our harvesting system has a pre-filter technology and then it will pull the liquid with the microbiome out of that habitat process it to obtain just the microbes, including the viruses, without damaging them or lysing the cells, put the clean water back because it's a 100% recovery of the microbiome. And then that will start preservation within a matter of minutes. In fact, in this chart, it shows two minutes and 14 seconds is the start of preservation. The next step is to take a portion, we wouldn't take all million grams, but to take a significant portion, let's say 10% of that, and lyophilize, freeze dry. Now we've made available the small molecules, and then we go through extractions, which are basically uh, various solvents um, in order to separate out the proteins, separate out the lipids, and focus on what would be the uh, right polarity of small molecules that have the highest probability for cellular signaling or drug-like molecules. Then we fraction that substantially in order to break down those tens of thousands, potentially a hundred thousand addressable small molecules so that they can build the library, do the analytical work on it, place inside of well plates for high throughput screening, and then make those available to our partners and our collaborators to find hits. 
Then it goes back to bring more once a hit has been found, analyze that hit, potentially do structural determination, look for sister molecules in nature so you can start to understand the IP. And the IP from these molecules includes activity. You can't patent a natural molecule, but if you discover what it can do, you can patent its activity. And then derivatization, meaning we've got the inspiration of the molecules in hand. We can chemically or synthetically derivatize these or improve them. We can also computationally improve them. And the whole goal is to build the IP around that. And what you see now is you see bottle samples can be the start of it. That second chart shows peak molecules that are unknown. The diversity is demonstrated there by the genomics. And that small unit that has the two people standing beside it is a scout harvester that has the capability to do 10,000 liters generally. It can do more. And then the full-scale harvester is right now a fairly large system, but it can go unescorted over the road, and it can process 20 million liters in order to obtain 1 million uh, uh, 1 million grams or a thousand kilograms of material. So scouting to find the right microbiome is not about targets. It's about finding environments that are rich with what, with opportunity. Exactly. Opportunity. It's, it's it's exactly. It is prospecting, but when you have such rich sources, this prospecting can be a little, let's say lower of the priority. Now, five years from now, prospecting had better be very good because you don't want to go to a site where 90% of the small molecules have already been discovered. You would like to find diversity at the highest level every time. Right. And these are going to be sites that, that, uh, that, uh, the researcher is not going to have any property rights over. Right. So you're not going to be able to, uh, you know, exclude other people coming and scouting in in that area? There, 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 is, there is some questions about that. So when you look at biodiversity, some of it's related to uh, um, places that should have rights to what exists within their lands. And some of it relates to indigenous knowledge. Microbes don't have hardly any indigenous knowledge. So when you look at some of the treaties, that may not apply. When you look at biodiversity treaties, I would say there's going to be things that apply and wherever someone would harvest in the future. And right now, we're the only ones in the world practicing this technology. In fact, this technology isn't even being taught in any academic institution right now. This is so new and so revolutionary that you have got PhD researchers graduating right now and have never heard of anything like this. So this is a real breakthrough in capability that is just on the edge. Uh, and it's going to change in time. And it's going to change so much in time that I would be bold enough to say 10 years after we start our full scale execution, there will be hardly a research institution that isn't looking at this or practicing this, and that most pipelines of new products in life sciences will probably emerge from the wealth of molecules that come directly from microbiomes. Now, why I can so easily say that and not flinch one bit, 1% of the microbes that could culture gave us 50% of the drugs. That's just part of the equation. The other part of the equation is every researcher over the last 40 years have talked about genomics, have talked about the metabolic pathways, have talked about synthetic biology and synthetic chemistry, indirect approaches to get at nature's hidden secrets. Why use indirect approaches other than tools to help understand nature's secrets when you can go get nature's secrets? You, you don't have to wait. And I, I use the example that would you go mine 
lithium with this cup. Why wouldn't we mine lithium with this cup? It's the wrong scale. These small molecules exist in nature. You need to go get them at the right scale. The harvesting seems to be equally as important as the scouting and finding the right uh, ecosystem because you've got to be able to uh, be efficient with it. And I think that's what this slide speaks to. It, it sure does. And then it speaks a little bit to the partners and supporters we've had in developing the technology and want to work with us moving it forward. So we've worked with a variety of people in the past. Uh, definitely not everyone's listed here. But one of the things we find interesting in this slide is the permits, the ability for us to do this virtually unabated in the U.S., meaning we've been able to get a permit and we've been able to do the harvesting and we've been able to retain the rights every place we've gone. And usually we create a cooperative relationship. It may be data. It may be understanding of their waters. But we've got uh, people that are dealing with the aquatic environments that want solutions. So going to, let's say, Chesapeake Bay, there are many people that are concerned about the environment, the habitat, and what is going on in that particular area. Give you another example. Over the last several years, Florida has been, I mean, they've lost billions of dollars of tourism over red tide. Understanding red tide, understanding when it's going to bloom, understanding are there any opportunities to mitigate it is not just a Florida issue. It's a Middle East issue. It's a worldwide issue with implications and sustainability of a potential future product that could be worth massive amounts to communities that have to deal with that. Yes, yes. And um, the implications for uh, waters and, and, and microbiomes outside of the U.S. is significant. And I would say that uh, be because there are many bio, very diverse uh, microbiomes outside of the U.S. So the question is, what is the applicability and the willingness and the desire, or do you see promise outside of the U.S.? Well, as a business guy mostly and an engineer mostly, I think about networks and I think about building. So I love the idea of having collaborators worldwide. I love the idea of sharing data worldwide. Um, I think it's an opportunity that exists. It's going to happen one way or another. I hope that we can lead this revolution. But when you look at the diversity of habitats, it's immense around the world. Uh, when you talk about your own backyard, Panama, it would be a rich, rich, biodiverse source of aquatic habitats where the differences in the habitats in the U.S. could, quite frankly, show up substantially. Now, we won't really know till we start looking, but right now, uh, nobody knows. Um, so that means every place you look is going to be a rich source of tens of thousands of potentially 100,000 of addressable small molecules from a given microbiome and closing in on what is those secrets of the genes, the metabolic pathways, gene clusters to that chemistry in the activity of the chemistry. I think it's going to be a boon to life sciences and humanity. Right, this was a study that was done in uh, last year uh, about um, natural product databases in Latin America. And the conclusion that these scientists uh, came to was that more than a third or at least a third of the biodiversity um, in the world is in Latin America. Um, and that there is a wealth of um, natural product, uh, natural, natural products within Latin America and in, in our microbiomes that uh, that need to be studied and, and mined uh, for that matter. Um, 
Also, um, this study showed some of the uh, Latin American product databases that are existing, um, which is uh, an illustration evidence manifestation that this is um, a mature area for Latin America. I mean, these databases are, are um, up to date and um, show a lot of promise about uh, natural product organisms that could lead to drug discovery. Uh, you know, one of the issues that a couple of issues in in Latin America that uh, that need to be addressed are one, the price of pharmaceuticals, right, which is very expensive. It's expensive around the world, but pharmaceuticals are very expensive in Latin America. And that is, there are a lot of components and a lot of variables that cause uh, that going on. So it's not just about pipeline. Um, but do you believe that increasing the source through the work that you're doing um, in small molecules could have some impact on, you know, reducing prices for pharmaceuticals in, you know, the developing world. I, I do. And um, I've got to be honest, and, and I'm sure I am uh, have a preference to microbes, but microbes, as you had mentioned earlier, they were the first organisms on the planet. They've evolved into everything. They're interconnected to every species today. A lot of the plant microorganisms create the, the metabolites that we've found in plants. And then through redundancy of how nature, once it finds a molecule, once it finds a pathway that works, that pathway will show up in many other organisms. I think the efficiency and the speed is not to mow down acres of rainforest looking for plants, but look for the microbes. Look for the microbes in those areas. Look for the microbes in those lakes, in those rivers, in the oceans, in the estuaries. Look for the microbes first. We will get a lot further in science, in life sciences, because you're talking cell to cell communication with those small molecules. And everything in biology that's really hidden from us, really hidden from us that matters is what are those molecules? What do they turn off? Turn on, turn off, turn up or down. And microbes are the source of the future because of efficiencies and speed and low hanging fruit. And this technology is going to enable that versus the old technologies, which were incredibly inefficient. Right. This, um, this graph shows uh, developmental phase uh, drugs, pharmaceuticals uh, across the region um, through different phases and, and where, the, where it falls out country by country. This slide shows um, for the same period of time, which was uh, 2021, uh, by product, right? So the orange is naturally derived products, right? So, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about small molecules that were molecules that were taken from directly from nature. Um, I think this is an important slide because it shows that there's already some traction within the region for uh, the development of natural products or the development of pharmaceuticals that, are, that, that have their origins in naturally derived products yeah. and that um, this uh, I think your technology could uh, could accelerate this process and um, but you can see that natural derived products uh, um, have significant traction uh, in the region yeah I, uh, I, I think you're 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 spot on there and one of the accelerating capabilities of industrial scale microbiome mining is there's very few microbial based small molecules available to researchers that have been well annotated that are available in libraries to research. You're talking about a very small quantity, yet one microbiome will deliver approximately 80,000 novel small molecules. So we're on the edge of having a Moore's curve type growth to understanding the small molecules that exist in biology 
And I would say early implementation of industrial scale microbiome mining will lead to easily a doubling of known molecules within the first two years and a doubling again within the next two years. So we could have a Moore's curve like growth rate to these small molecules. And it really is going to be a race to IP. It's going to be who gets the molecules that's going to cure what is a billion dollar opportunity first. And I think it will engage many uh, uh, once this technology starts to prove it's delivering results. And I think in the life science area, when you talk about proof, it is an industry that waits for proof. There's really not a, and, and I hate to say this, there's not the dynamic of thought leadership the way there is in other industries. The mm -hmm. tech industry is a perfect example of people go and do things at a risk because they think it's going to work. In this industry, people do things only if it has a high, high probability of working. And even if it has a high probability of working in their mind, it has a high failure rate because the life science industry is incredibly tough and brutal on investor dollars. So you, you the dynamic that you foresee is um, a specialization of of Biosortia and um, accumulating these small molecules, building a library that therefore you can work with collaborators who are in other phases of the drug development pipeline. Do you, uh, in other words, do you see Biosortia being vertically integrated and doing different phases or, or, or just focusing on building the library? I think we'll be focused on building the libraries supporting partners that are, you know, are asking us to do things where they will pay us up front to provide them a certain number of molecule against targets over a period of time and that we'll have successes there. Or if we don't have successes, we'll continue to provide those molecules. So I think we'll have paid industrial partners. And I think we'll have a wealth of academic partners because the ac academic partners could help us on our industrial delivery of molecules. What we really like about the academic partners is almost every academic researcher we work with is always thinking about how do I move that out of my lab and into the commercial world? And we think that way as well. So we align with what wants to happen uh, with all of those researchers. So we just need to be great at supporting our partners and our researchers. And lastly, patents, intellectual property. Uh, where does Biosortia stand with patented processes? Yeah, so on our processes, we, did, we do have four issued patents on what we call generation one of our technology. Um, we're at generation four of our technology and generation two couldn't do what we could do today and same thing with generation three. We've kept these as trade secrets as we advance the technology. And the reason for that is we want to have our head start. Uh, patent laws are there to give us a head start. We want to take advantage of that. And we think most of the IP in the future will come from the molecules. The beautiful part about the molecules with partners, if they're hiring us to find and build a pipeline for them, they'll want the molecules patent. If we're working with academics, they'll, in many cases by law, are required to file the patents. So they need to own the patents, but we would have rights to those patents. So in many cases, we just need to do a QC level of making sure the patents are created properly and that we're involved in that process. But we think that in this world, of industrial scale microbiome mining, that it will break the top 10 related to the most IP being created in life sciences within the next three years from execution. So when you talk about having Harvard ecosystem, Stanford's ecosystem, 
uh, Princeton, Ohio State, University of Michigan, University of Rhode Island, Florida International University, George Mason University, national labs like uh, Los Alamos National Lab, all working within the industrial scale microbiome mining and trying to find hits, trying to find targets, trying to find cures or treatments, the amount of IP created from this technology will be large. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the takeaway. Uh, if I had to put my finger on one slide that people should take away is, is all of the targets that are possible uh, when this technology is brought to fruition. And um, it is uh, limitless, the amount of good that, that you are gonna do. Uh, Ross, we, we really appreciate your time. We're gonna be following you and working and trying to you know, uh, match you up with people in the region if we can. And um, we wish you all the luck in what you're doing because you're doing good work. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I, I've got to put one plug in there. We do have a website, biosortia.com. Any researcher, any potential partner, anybody that wants to write about what we're trying to do, please reach out to us. We're also available on LinkedIn. Tony, we look so forward to working with Latin America. Uh, I, I, I am ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. Well, thanks again, and uh, good luck to you, and, and uh, we'll be following you from Panama. Thank you so much. All right.